no, I, I watched a lot of James Bond, read a lot of Nancy Drew. The, the, the girl sleuth trope had always been kind of appealing to me. Um, but it wasn't until I was watching Alias one night, and I loved Alias. It was one of my favorite shows. And there was an old flashback episode of when the main character's half-sister was growing up in an orphanage in Argentina. And she was running through the halls in the middle of the night. And I kind of was just half watching out of the corner of my eye. And my first instinct was, oh my gosh, I bet she went to a boarding school for spies. And of course, that wasn't what was actually going on in, in the clip. But that was where my mind went. And I thought, well, now I've got to write about a boarding school for spies. <laughs> now, what kind of research did you do? I did a lot of research, especially in the beginning. How should the school be set up? What would be the, the subjects and the, the topics that the real spies would have to study? I knew that languages would be important, math, science. Um, one of the key jobs of the spy is being able to sort of blend in anywhere they go. So I wanted to make sure that the girls understood the, the countries of the world and the various cultures around the world. Um, I did a lot of research on that via the International Spy Museum. They have a great website. They have a wonderful gift shop if you're ever in the Washington, D.C. area. And one day I just kind of went in there about halfway um, through the writing process and said, okay, give me what I need. And so the, the workers there were incredibly helpful, as most independent bookstore workers are, and they knew exactly what I needed, and they just went through pulling stuff and, and sent me home with a suitcase full of books. So it was very helpful. I almost called my teacher for the International Spy Museum. <laughs> so is it different writing a spy paper versus writing a con story? There, there are definitely similarities, and there are slight differences. But really, it's they're, they're kind of just two different sides of the same coin in, in many, many ways. And um, probably the biggest difference between the two series is that Hanny, my protagonist in the Spy series, really wants to know what her parents' life was. She really wants to live that life and experience it and go down the spy route. Whereas Kat, the main character in my Thief series, Kat's burned out. She is the oldest 15-year-old in the world. She's been doing this since she was three and she just wants to walk away from the life. So really the, the biggest difference is, in just, is just in the characters themselves and kind of how how their parents' profession has cha has shaped their childhood. Yeah, have you learned any cool tricks or techniques from doing, you know, learning about cons and spies? I have learned a few real cons. Holly Black and I are always tempted to try a con <laughs> called Dog in a Bar. We are totally going to do that one of these days and we can just get our hands on a dog and that's the only thing st stopping us. Um, and yes, I'm freakishly aware in parking garages. I'm like, oh, who is where? Where did I park my car? You know, was that there? Who's, why does that car have tinted windows? I'm like a crazy woman in a parking garage. Nobody's ever going to attack me there if you live to tell the tale. Um, so yeah, I definitely, uh, you pick up things about anti-surveillance and you know, oh, that should probably not be parked on that side of the street. What's going on there? And so you just get far more aware of your surroundings, which is not a bad thing. Now, are you ever tempted, like when you walk into a museum or a jewelry store, do you just end up casing the joint? Oh, I totally <laughs> case the joint, yes. I was in Italy last year for the Bologna Book Fair, and Sarah Riesbrenn, an author of The Demon's Lexicon, and I have the same agent. So we came in a day early, we went to Venice, and we're walking around Venice and going to all these museums. Our guide was talking about how this incredibly valuable painting was in this church, and I'm like, they have no motion detectors in this entire place. <laughs> like, this would be a fairly easy job. <laughs> so, but I guess they think it's Venice and you're going to have a really hard time getting away. So. Yeah, well, you know, the L.A. Jewelry District is just a few blocks away uh, from where is, we are. This is kind of tempting, <laughs> yes. Now, do you have a Gilmore Girl, or Gilmore Girls, goodness, what am I talking about? Gallagher Girls series that's evolved over four books. Do you think there needs to be a nemesis for this kind of storytelling? Yes. I don't know if nemesis, but there needs to be an external conflict. Lots and lots of external conflict. And um, it's been, I, I knew in, in the first couple of books, it was it was really not a character study by any stretch of the imagination, but, but it was about trying to figure out what this life was and what this world was. And I also knew that to keep telling their story, I had to bring, take their, their life and their challenge outside of the walls of the school. I knew that we can't just continue to learn about um, covert operations in theory, that eventually the stakes have got to become real for the girls. And so that was one of the, a very conscious decision to make. And, and I'm really glad I went there. And in fact, I'm in the midst of writing book five, 
think we're getting even darker for the gals and girls. It is not, it is not easy. Life is not easy at Spy School these days. No. So. Are you going to continue to stay after they graduate? Will there be Spy College or is this high school on again? <laughs> spy College, Spy Grandchildren. <laughs> I guess it depends on how sales for other things go. Um, I was, I was laughing the other day that I probably won't have Brett Gallagher with him. Gallagher retirees, you know. I have Gallagher retirees. That would, awesome. that would be kind of awesome, would it not? Starring like Helen Mirren and yes. Judy Dench and all. Oh yes, gosh. yeah. I think that I could totally go there. Um, but right now, the plan is to just do six books, and it will probably depend on on where the characters are and how I feel about them. Um, that will also take them through graduation. So I would kind of like to hope at that point that they're they're fully trained spies and that they're capable of, of, of handling whatever comes at them after that. So maybe maybe they'll be able to make it to that at some point. Now will Katarina have a nemesis? Will Katarina have a nemesis? Katarina, I see that that book or series is going to be a little bit more episodic probably than the Gallagher Girls. I think she will have a lot of nemesis. I think that in every book she will have someone um, who stands between her and whatever it is she needs to steal. And so over, I think that we will probably have some people who come back in periodically just because it's nice to see old faces. Um, but for the most part, she's going, she's going to have a lot of different challenges, I think, in her career. Is she ever gonna get out of the business entirely? Is she ever gonna get out of the business entirely? Right now, I don't think so. I think right now, you know, the first book, kind of her story arc in that was she wanted out of the business and they kept sucking her back in. In the second book, she's realized that she can, she can steal things, but she just, as long as she steals them for really good causes, it's okay. And so I think perhaps she's, she's even crazier about stealing stuff in the future because, because now she looks around the world at all the injustice and she's like, there's so much, that not that I want to steal, but that I have to steal to kind of go on her, you know, sort of mission. Have you ever watched the TV show about Leverage? Oh, I love Leverage. Absolutely love leverage. It's really fun. I want to be Parker when I grow up. Me too. <laughs> I was thinking, you and her, John Rogers is the writer behind that show. Oh. You, Holly, and John Rogers never got together. Watch out, world. <laughs> I mean, you can take anything. You'd be terrified. But now for, it, I saw some jackets of a cover girl, Her Society 2, but there's talk of a curse. Yes. Is that, without getting too spoilery, uh -huh. are you opening up the world a little bit for fantastical elements? Or is oh. this more of an exercise in paranoia and bad luck and how that affects novels? That's a great question. And, and the answer is, is no. It's still realistic fiction. Um, but if you, I, I really thought long and hard about what she should be stealing this time. You know, in the first book it was art and paintings. And I didn't want to go back to another art heist. I wanted it to be some other kind of paper. And so the next obvious decision was to do a jewel heist. And when you look at the famous jewels throughout history, there's a long history of them being supposedly cursed. The Hope Diamond is probably the one that, that comes to most people's mind first, and then a lot of other, other stones as well. And so I knew that there had to be a reason, uh, many, many different reasons why people would tell Kat not to do it. And I thought one of them should definitely be that it's cursed. Not only cursed in the mainstream sense that all the owners have had bad things happening to it, um, I've also thought it might be great for all the thieves who have gone after it, after it in history, bad things have happened to them too. So that's kind of, it is It is one of Uncle Eddie, who is the patriarch of Cat's family. Uncle Eddie, Eddie has very few jewels, and one of them is you do not steal the Cleopatra. It is forbidden, you do not go there, because bad things happen to thieves who try it. And so, that's where the curse comes from. Have you ever looked at the Hope Diamond before? I have. I saw it at the Smithsonian, probably when I was so it won't remember me. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I did see it and I thought, wow, so that's what all the press is about. <laughs> I, was, I remember being really nervous. I looked at it and I was like, oh, this is scared. You know, you don't want to get too close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we've got Uncommon Criminals coming out in July? In June, June 1st. 1st. And then when do we see that? I was like, July, Girls. Gallagher Girls. Um, um, it will probably be out in early 2012. I don't know an exact date yet, but look for it January or February. It is, it is the darkest of all the books yet. Um, I don't want to spoil the end of book four for anyone, but in this one, I will have to spoil, I haven't really talked about it yet. Is it getting personal? It is very personal. It is incredibly personal. 
Penny is realizing that she's made some big mistakes and she's looking at the consequences of those mistakes. And she's going to have, she's, they're getting much, much closer to the answers. And that is, that's a good thing. But it's also kind of scary when you don't like what the answers are. And so it, I'm doing a terrible job describing it. I've just turned into rough draft. I, I really don't want to spoil the core. Um, will there be more about Candy's father? Yes. Yes. We will learn more about Candy's father. We will learn more about Circle Cabin. We will learn about the We will learn about Zach and his family. And we learn a lot of stuff in this book. Even though it's the, not the last book in the series, I think readers, a lot of the types of things that a lot of series save until the final book. I'm, I'm putting it all on the table. So we're gonna we're gonna see where it happens, where it goes. And, and again, it's just first draft at this point, and who knows what my editor might say. Yo, this is stupid. Why are you doing this? This book needs to go in the trash, and we need to start all over from scratch. That's happened before, and it will happen again. <laughs> so I'm not saying that anything I just said actually has any relevance whatsoever, because who knows? Fair enough, but it's good. Writing six books, and you're you just turned it five. You must have a crazy idea of what you need to do. Yes, I'm getting six. You know, I think it's kind of like going through a maze, and with every choice you make, you get closer and closer, and you get the choices get fewer and fewer. And so, as we get to book five, there are certain things that have to happen. As we get to book six, there are certain things that have to happen. And I've just got to kind of I'm lining up the dominoes right now so that I can flip them and they can all fall down. Great. Great. So my last question. Because we are at the romantic time. Oh, romantic romantic time. Time. What is your favorite romantic moment ever? Be it books, film, TV, anything. Oh my goodness. I ew. Like, <laughs> oh. I really love, and this is kind of cheesy, but it's like in my dream, I'm single, but in my dream, it's the dream proposal. At the end of While You Were Sleeping, the great movie with Sandra Bullock. And she's working at a subway or the, the L in Chicago, in the train system. And the guy, her, the love interest, is, walks up with the entire family, and everybody's flip, flipping tokens in, and she's taking the tokens and taking the tokens. And he flips in the engagement ring. And he, she flips it out and looks at it, and he's like, Do you wanna? <laughs> and I just, I always, <laughs> I always thought, Yeah, that's, that's the guy right there. No candles, no That's rose petals. You don't need the kneeling, you don't need the there's... no banners, no pigeons. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but I think that's what love is, right there. <laughs> Not the biggest romantic in the world, right here, if you can't tell. <laughs> Good answer, though. <laughs> All right, well, thank but you. Here's the two of them. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you.